And now let's pray our prayer of preparation and ask the Holy Spirit to shape us and make us like Jesus. Let's pray. You know, Holy Spirit, we were talking this morning in the adult Sunday school about this particular prayer and how we, we call it uh, an invocation uh, and that, that we're asking you to come near. And we realize that you are always here. You're always near. What we're functionally doing is praying that we would come near to you so that you would come near to us. And there are often so many things that could distract, that could work to keep us away from you. And so, Lord, we want to just drop all of that stuff. And Holy Spirit, just have you show up in a way that is unignorable. I loved how in the book of Acts you showed up with a mighty sound of a wind and flames of fire over the, the early church's head. I don't know if you want to do something miraculous like that, but help us to recognize that you're here. So as we dive into the word this morning, we don't want this to be just a, a religious time. We don't want this just to be human, but something eternal. Something that shapes us. And so if there's anything merely human here, let that be forgotten and only that which is from you would remain and take root. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You know, it's, it's been said often by a lot of preachers that Jesus taught more about money than anything else. Well, if you look at, Jesus taught 39 parables and 11 of them were about money. It was pretty important. But that's not really the whole picture. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, we're going to read a parable that frankly has made me uncomfortable ever since I started following Jesus. I will just tell you right up front, I don't like this parable. It makes me squirm. And so when I realized that this was the parable we were going to be looking at, I figured I'd better do some work on me and figure out why is it that this makes me squirm? What's really going on here? Luke chapter 16. And I, I came to realize that what this is really about, even though it, money is the structure that it's all hung on, is it's talking about what matters to the Messiah. What is it that matters to the Messiah? So let's look at verses 1 through 4 to kind of get into this idea. Jesus tells his disciples, by the way, that's you and me. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be a manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. <gasps> I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So what matters to the Messiah first is the matter of character. That's what's kind of introduced in this first topic. Now, verses 1 through 4, I, I want you to realize something. This parable makes the most sense, at least to me, when we figure out who's the rich man and who's the manager and who everybody else is. You, you kind of have to get your cast of characters. This rich man isn't just any rich man. This is God. And the shrewd manager are all of the official religious people who claim to speak for him, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, Jesus is talking, specifically teaching his disciples. But if we jump a little farther into the text, verse 14, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this. So you can kind of picture it in your mind, can't you? Jesus is teaching someplace, and he's teaching a gathering of his disciples, people who are doing their level best to follow him. And on the outskirts are the scribes and the Pharisees probably standing there with their hands on their hips or 
folded or frumpy frowns on their face because they know they're the ones being talked about. They don't miss it. There's a lesson here. And not just for these disciples and not just for the Pharisees, but for us today as well. We are going to be called to account on how we use our lives. We are all going to be called to account on how we use our lives. Not to guilt you, not to scare you, but just to make sure that as runners in the race, we are fixing our eyes on the finish line. Hebrews says that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our, finisher of our faith. He's the one who put us in the race the first time, and now he's at the, the end line going, come on, guys, you can make it. You can make it a little more, a little more, some of you a lot more, but keep going. Jesus is cheering you on and wants you to know that we all have to give an account of how we run this race. That's what matters to the Messiah, our character. The fact that how we run the race is important as the fact that we're in the race in the first place. The, the second idea is like it. Let's look at verses 5 through 7. Now we get into the meat of what this plan is that the shrewd manager has. So, he called in each one of his master's debtor. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, well, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. And then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A, a thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. Well, take your bill and make it 800. Th this next thing, verses 5, 6, and 7, this is all about the matter of management. The shrewd manager calls the, the debtors in. Now, this could be something that would be easy to miss, so I want to draw your attention. He called in the master's debtors. So the debtors come to the master's house, and they know they owe a lot. And the manager says to them, he's representing himself as the master's authorized representative. He, he's not technically authorized anymore, is he? He's lost his job. But before he's out on the street, he figures, I got one more shot at this. So he lessens the debts that are owed to the manager. He's actually acting in his own self-interest. Now, put, your, put a mental bookmark here and think back to the parable of the talents, another parable that Jesus told where he takes three servants and he says that a rich man gives each one of them a certain number of talents, a, a certain value of money. And says, I'm going to be back in a while. You'll have to give an account for it. So a year passes by. It's time to give account. The one who had been given five talents has made five more. So now there's ten and he gives it all back to the master. Ah, well done. You've done well in little. You're going to be faithful in much. The guy who was given two talents invested those and made back double and gives it back to the master. The master says the same thing. And the last guy, to whom the master only gave one talent, says, well, I know you're a hard man, and I know you reap where you don't sow, and I was afraid that I was going to screw this up, so I just buried this thing. So here it is, back. I've even brushed the dust off, right? Here you go, all, you, all yours, right? And the master is not happy. You could have at least put it in the bank and got interest from it. You are going to be called into account for what you're given and how you manage what you've been given. Stewards are expected to make investments on behalf of the master. That makes sense. But consider this. You are stewards. God has gifted you with all kinds of talents and abilities and treasure. And you're expected to use whatever God has given you in kingdom work. Now, here's the truth of it. Some of you may think, man, there is way too much month at the end of the money anyway. So, Pastor Ed, how can you be talking to me about money? And I'm, I'm not. I'm talking about investing who you are 
in ways that will make a difference. Apparently, I have been told that I, I have had in my family background a, a great grandfather or great great or an uncle or something, someone in there was a minister. And yet, my family of origin didn't pass that down to me. That was a talent that got buried. I think I'm just blessed that God uncovered it in my life. Look around. We have little kids in here. The state of the church in America in 2021, we keep hearing dire things. Oh, the church is not, not going well. We have little kids in here. We have the future in here. And if I talk about it too much, I will lose the ability to speak. We are investing into the lives of these little ones. You are investing into the lives of your little ones. And the other little ones who happen to be running around with them. This might sound odd, but I'll say it anyway. Some of these little kids are so unaware of everybody else around them. They're just, they're, they're just living in a land of giants, right? A whole bunch of tall people. But they get excited because they're here. And they know that this is a neat place some some reason. And so they'll run in that ramp. Well, that's a cool ramp, guys. <laughs> they run down that ramp. They run up and down that ramp. It's neat. Now, I have been in some churches where if children are running, that's a bad thing and they get sternly pointed at and shaken at and you know we definitely need to teach our kids you know some of these giants that you're around are old and don't see well so you need to navigate and be careful but speaking to the old giants now who don't see well okay yes absolutely you and me danny here's the thing when we know that there are kids around we could frown but if, if when we look at them, we could remember, oh, that's right. They're in a place where they see God's love reflected on our faces. Well, I better show them Jesus. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I kind of think they ran to him, don't you? You see, here's the second lesson. Even when you're serving your own ends, you're always representing the master. You're always representing the master. I got a call this last week. Um, I'm, in, I'm in a lot of trouble and I need financial help and can you help me? And I had to tell them, no, I can't. We don't have any funds like that. I don't think any churches in Warden have funds like that because it's a really poor community. But before I could say, but if you would come to church, I might be able to introduce you to people who could help you. They hung up. They just thought, I can't get what I, my immediate need met, and so click. And it breaks my heart. We have the opportunity to represent the master in everything we do. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. There's more. After hearing what this dishonest manager did. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. Honestly, verses 8 and 9 are the ones that have always made me really uncomfortable to read because I didn't understand what Jesus was getting at. Lord, Lord, these people are not acting like God would. Why would you commend them? You notice what it does say? It says that the master recognizes the shrewd manager's actions because that guy 
made a choice that could have benefited the master as well as himself. Now, I don't know if you have ever been in a spot like this when you're dealing with bills, but realizing, okay, I have X number of dollars to pay my Y number of bills. And so you have to prioritize and figure out which bill you're going to pay first, second, third. And some of the bills, boy, I, I just can't pay all of this bill. I'll pay down a little of it because that's all I've got. That idea of trying to do that, there, there's a whole industry that has been uh, made around, look, if you owe too much money, I'll tell you what, you combine all of your money together under our bill consolidation thing, we'll pay off your creditors, we'll negotiate with your creditors to lower the bill cost because that way they know they'll get paid. Exactly what's going on here. And so the master sees this guy and I think it's entirely possible that the master is saying, okay, this guy, even on his way out, he's definitely trying to line his own, his own bed, but he's made steps that are likely to get me actually paid as opposed to the guy who thinks, well, I owe you a thousand and I can't pay it. So that bill's just going to get deferred another month until I get a thousand. Well, I'll probably get lower than that faster than the whole thing. So this actually does benefit the master. And it took me a while to kind of unpack that. It, it might be true that the first time I read this, I hadn't had enough experience with funds <laughs> to, to kind of get that. Now I get it. The master's going to get paid. Jesus says to use worldly advantages for heavenly purposes. Jesus says to use worldly advantages for heavenly purposes. Now, what does that look like for us? Well, let's be honest. There's guys, sometimes gals, who stand out on the side of the road and they've got a sign, please help. And every time I go by, I look at their shoes and I see if their shoes are in really good condition. And if I do, I know they probably don't really need my help. But when the kids were little, we, had, we would put little help bags together. And there'd be a toothbrush and toothpaste. And we almost always had those granola bars around. So there would be, granola bars would go in them, a washcloth, maybe a pack of socks. And so... When we're driving along and the girls will say, oh, Daddy, there's somebody who needs help. I'm like, well, we can help. We're, we're prepared for this. We are in a position to do that for others around us. Now, how you will implement that might look different depending on who you are and what your circumstance is, but look for the opportunity to help. Now, be warned that this using worldly advantages for heavenly purposes, Jesus warns that it cuts both ways. Being trustworthy with whatever resources you have is always better, short and long term. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Lesson three, influence always has eternal echoes. People watch you and what they determine will matter in eternity. So which side are you showing? Which side are you showing? And then to wrap this up, there are three questions here that Jesus kind of asks in verses 11, 12, and 13. So let's read those. Verse 11, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Christ's questions for today. Will you live so that people trust you 
with true value? Will you live so that people will trust you with true value? Will you live so that you will be able to trust others? Will you live in a way that will enable you to trust other people with things that are of value to you? And then finally ask yourself, who's your actual master? Who's really calling the shots? Let's pray. Master, sometimes this concept is really uncomfortable for us to think about. I mean, we know, you say, repeatedly in the scriptures, if anyone's going to call himself your disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me. The, the cross is an instrument of death. Other place, he must die to himself daily and follow me. And some days that's not too difficult. And some days we can't manage it. We don't want to put ourselves to death because we want to do what we want to do. And so Lord, this, this sermon, this whole section, money is just the, the means by which we deal with the issues of character and management and influence. If there is anything in us that is resistant, that is sitting there with our arms folded and well, I'm not doing that stuff. That's crazy. We, ploy, we pray, Lord, that you would help us lay that down and come to the cross and say you win. Be our master today and every day. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.